semester, we're really excited to have Sam Spiro here from UCSD talking to us about semi-restricted rock, paper, scissors. Yes, thank you, Emily, and thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, so to start things off, we're going to have uh, a bit of a game, which is not rock, paper, scissors. Um, so Chris has volunteered to be my volunteer, and he shuffled this deck of cards somewhat well. So um, Chris, I'm going to play the following game. So uh, I've drawn the top card. I want you to guess what this card is. You don't have to tell me the suit, just whether it's a 2, 3, Jack, Queen, King, what the value of the card is. Do you have any guess? Okay, it's a 2. Ah, close. It's an 8. <laughs> um, uh, oh well. Um, I'll give you a, a second try. Um, and now, given that I just discarded an 8 from the deck, mm -hmm. what's the one card you should not guess here? Probably an 8. Probably an 8 would be a bad idea, because there's only 3 of those left mm -hmm. in the deck, or anything else. So if it's uniformly shuffled, which who knows if it is. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, do you have any guess for this? Or a 10. All right, Queen, you're closer in value. <laughs> okay. but, uh, yeah, so um, we could keep going if uh, I, I didn't have much prepared, but fortunately, or for, unfortunately, I do. Um, so, I'm guaranteed to win. Yeah, yeah, eventually he's guaranteed to get at least four points. Um, if you do, if you're, exactly, exactly. Um, so, of course, we don't have to work with a, a standard deck of playing cards here. Um, you know, in general, we're going to be working with um, decks of size MN. Uh, which have uh, n different card types, each appearing with multiplicity m. So as like, uh, you know, just to, to ground yourselves a bit, um, you know, if you have a standard deck of playing cards, you have uh, 13 types of cards, each appearing with uh, multiplicity 4. So that's your response to, to these parameters here. Um, and the way this game is going to work is I will, you know, shuffle this deck of cards, or have someone shuffle the deck of cards uniformly at random, then, you know, draw each card sequentially and have the player guess and their score at the end of the game. So we'll play until the deck is depleted, and the score at the end of the game is the number of times they get a, a correct guess. So we want to understand mathematically like, how this game behaves. So um, we have this, uh, so if you have a strategy G for the guesser, then um, we'll define CMNG uh, to be the expected number of points scored by the guesser uh, if they follow the strategy and if the deck is shuffled uniformly at random. And as an extremal combinatorialist, I care about you know, what are the, the maximum and minimum scores a player can expect to get uh, in this game using their optimal strategy. And to some extent, this problem was solved by uh, Percy Diaconis and Ron Graham. They show that the maximum and scores are uh, roughly m plus or minus square root of m uh, plus some error term. And they can even tell you exactly what this uh, constant uh, cn is. Um, so this is nice to know that they solved the problem. But in some sense, the, the answer is like a little boring in the sense that you know, no matter what strategy you know, Chris uses here, uh, he's going to get about M points. Even if he just gets his ace the entire game, it, it doesn't do much better or much worse than like, the, the best or worst strategy here. Um, and so this result here is with the N fixed, the number of card types, uh, as the number of multiplicity grows. So we decided to look at this when you flip the parameters, when you now have the multiplicity fixed, but the number of card types is tending towards infinity. Um, and here the behavior is significantly different. So for your maximum score, it's basically log n times some uh, constant, which is the mth harmonic number. And the, the minimum score is now like n to the minus 1 over m uh, times some weird uh, constant, depending on the gamma function. So in particular, this quantity here is tending towards infinity as your primary uh, like variable tends towards infinity. Well, this term here is tending towards 0. So very, very different behaviors uh, for the maximum and minimum. And I'll note that um, Jimmy He and uh, Andrea Ottolini here got like much better like balance for these things. They can do like error terms like up to however far you want. So like these quantities are very very well understood. Um, so okay, we now want to you know try and do a new game. So um, there's a number. Don't doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> anyway, Chris, we're gonna play this game one more time, but we're gonna a slight change will happen once two card types have been revealed. So okay, okay do you have any guesses for for this first? Again, the number. Yeah, just the number. Uh, it's a king. All right, it's an ace. So close of you to the sick with it. All right, now do you have a guess for this one? Two. All right, you're. <laughs> this is why I had Chris shuffle the deck ahead of time so that you wouldn't complain when things like this happen. Uh, anyway, do you have a guess for this one, Chris? It's a three. Okay, it's a, actually a third ace. <laughs> you, you, um, um, okay, fine. Uh, Chris, do you have a guess for this? It's a three. All right, it's an ace. Oh my uh, God. Does anyone have a guess for what the probability is that a, a uniformly shuffled deck of cards has four aces at the beginning? It's a one in 270,725. Uh, so from this, we conclude one of two things. Either uh, Chris here was really unlucky 
um, or the deck was not shuffled uniformly at random. And in fact, it was not. It was shuffled according to, I had Chris shuffled the deck and then sneakily put four aces on top when he wasn't looking. Uh, I, I, I made a poor decision with you as the, the, the volunteer, though. It was really tough, like, like right up right here, trying to do it. But fortunately, I managed. I think Percy can do it. Yeah, yeah, per yes. Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I came up with the, uh, this idea for a joke when I was uh, prepping the talk on this thing here. But the problem was, I couldn't justify including it in the talk. I, I didn't want to do it as like the first example, because I would just throw people off. And I didn't really want to do it at the end, because I didn't have any like, follow-up to what to say after that. Um, so naturally, I'm led to the following question, which is, um, can you do enough math <laughs> to justify including this in a talk? And you know, by virtue of me doing this, uh, the answer is yes. And, and the way you do this is by considering a two-player version of this game, where now, um, as the shuffler, I get to shuffle the deck however I want to. Then I'm going to give the deck to Chris, and he's going to guess according to that, that deck. Um, and we'll let, uh, similar to four, we'll let CMNGS be the expected number of points Chris can get if I shuffle the, uh, the, the deck according to some strategy S and he plays according to some strategy. Do I get to know your strategy? I can tell you in advance by like, you know, standard game theory, uh, whatever, like at the optimal strategies. We can tell each other our optimal strategies and neither of us will feel the need to, to move. Once you shuffle, you don't touch the deck again. Correct, yes, yes, yes. Um, but you, you can consider a version of this where instead um, shuffling the deck, at each round I just pick a card from the deck however I want to and then say, like, Chris, can you guess what this is? These are also mathematically equivalent because you just not imagine, um, like, the, what, the only extra information I get by, by doing this, like, round by round, like, online fashion is uh, knowing what Chris guessed beforehand, and that shouldn't influence my knowledge of what he's going to guess in the future. So you can consider either version where... Um, I go home at night and like just shuffle it and then bring it to Chris, or like each round I get to say, all right, uh, well maybe. And you know, if you kept guessing threes, you know, maybe I should like do something different. So like from the, the humanist perspective, they're perhaps different, but uh, mathematically they're the same uh, game. Um, yeah, and and just to ground ourselves a bit, um, you could consider uh, I could just you know shuffle the deck uniform random. That seems like the most natural thing to do. And if we do this, we know that the bounds for this quantity are between this mth harmonic number log n and this uh, weird guy here. This is just exactly the same game uh, as before, and these are just the optimal bounds that, that we know. So perhaps like a natural question to ask is, okay, say I'm trying to you know, make it so Chris gets as few guesses uh, correctly, uh, is there some better way I could shuffle the deck so that he gets much fewer than this many points? Um, and you know, it seems offhand like the uniform strategy would be like the most natural thing to do, uh, but it turns out you can do significantly better. It turns out that the right answer is actually a uh, log n. Um, and so it's the same order of magnitude, but like the, the constant is very different here. Here the constant is 1 and like independent of m entirely. Well here, this constant here is growing slowly but, but with m. So in this like adversarial version of the game, it doesn't matter whether the deck has one copy of each card or a million copies of each card, as long as a million is a fixed constant. Um, they're the same at least up to the, the main leading term here as opposed to the regular shuffling version where they're, they're significantly different. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, what this strategy is to get this bound. And it's something I call the greedy strategy. So the way this works is, um, or I'm going to take the perspective of this like online version that I mentioned before where I'll just pick the deck, the, the, the draw each time. And the way this works is if there's R types of cards remaining in the deck, I'll pick a number one through R uniformly at random and then draw that uh, corresponding card type irregardless of how many copies are actually in the deck of each type. So as an example, if the deck has 100 you know, aces and just a single two, I'll flip a coin and you know, pick either one or two with equal probability. And as you can see, like, this instance here is like, very different than, than what like, the uniform strategy would do in this scenario, where they would like, almost surely draw uh, a one here. Uh, and you can prove uh, that if I shuffle the deck according to this way, then by some variance of the coupon collector problem, uh, Chris can get at most roughly log n points uh, in expectation. And it's not hard to show that uh, there's another strategy which gives uh, at least, uh, if Chris follows some strategy, no matter how I do drop, uh, shuffle the deck, you can always get at least log n guesses um, asymptotically. So uh, this strategy is called the greedy strategy because you, it's not hard to show that for any given round, if I just really don't want Chris to get the correct guess there, I should do this greedy strategy here. Um, but it's not clear that it's uh, like a global optimal. It is, it is like asymptotically an optimal uh, strategy, or uh, yeah, optimal strategy, but it's not necessarily uh, globally. In particular, for this example here, 
it seems like I should not draw 1 and 2 with equal probability here. If I draw the 2, I'm in a really bad shape because Chris can just get you know, every single one after that point there. So it seems like in, in this scenario, I should perhaps draw two with like slightly smaller, or, yeah, slightly smaller uh, probability here. And it was somewhat surprising that uh, this greedy strategy is the unique optimal strategy in this game if I'm trying to minimize uh, the number of correct guesses that Chris gets. Perhaps even more surprising is that if Chris is trying to minimize his score for some reason, um, and I want him to maximize his score, the, also the unique optimal thing I can do is to play this exact same strategy. So it's like kind of interesting, if I, just want, I, if I know Chris is either trying to, to maximize or minimize his score, but I don't know which, and I just want to be nefarious, like the unique optimal thing I can do is this shuffling here. It somehow concentrates the score as much to the center as, as is possible. Um, uh, so any questions or comments up to this point? Okay, cool. Don't worry, we're going to get to rock, paper, scissors uh, in a moment. Um, but first I want to recast this game I just described in like a slightly different uh, perspective. And it comes from this game called uh, Matching Pennies, which is like a classical thing from, from game theory. Um, and the way this game works is not particularly exciting, but the way it works is that um, two players, Alice and Bob, pick their favorite number from one to n and shout it out loud. If they're the same number, uh, Alice will gain a point. If they're different numbers, Bob gains a point. Um, so uh, you know, this is something you can do with your friends if you're bored. Um, <laughs> And, uh, but the strategy is not that uh, interesting. It's, it, you just, both players just uniquely, just uniformly at random pick uh, a number that's their, their unique optimal thing. So the way we'll make this slightly more interesting is we'll consider what I call a, a semi-restricted version of this game. Where now we're gonna play MN rounds of this matching pennies game. Where now Bob has this extra restriction that he has to use each number uh, from one to N exactly M times, okay? Uh, so Bob was doing pretty poorly, uh, no, actually Bob was doing pretty well here in this game where, you know, Alice only got it if they matched, and now we're restricting it to, like, you know, maybe the game's a little more balanced. Um, and my claim is this game here is exactly the same as this adversarial card shuffling model. And, and the way you can see this is you can imagine, okay, uh, to help Bob keep track of what he's played so far, we'll give him a deck of cards at the beginning, which has um, n different card types, each label with um, m, each of them with multiplicity m. And uh, then each time he wants to play a card or make a move, maybe he'll like say, oh, I'm going to make a nine next, he'll draw the card and like about to discard it. Um, and that'll help him keep track of what he's doing. And then Alice will gain a point precisely if she can correctly guess what card type this is. So this, uh, this adversarial card game, even though it kind of originated uh, from this work of Percy and Ron, can be seen as a, a semi-restricted version of this kind of classic game theory problem. And given this perspective, it's natural to consider, you know, semi-restricted versions of, you know, your favorite game or whatever. Um, and, you know, as a concrete example, we'll consider uh, rock, paper, scissors, as was advertised in the talk. So again, just to, to restate things, we're going to consider um, a two-player game by, by two people called Ray and Norman. And the way this game works is you're going to play a bunch of rounds of rock, paper, scissors, and just for concreteness, the way rock, paper, scissors works is each round, uh, the players pick either rock, paper, or scissors, if uh, one person picks rock and the other person picks paper, then the paper person wins. If it's paper, scissors, scissors wins. If it's rock, scissors, uh, rock wins. If they pick the same thing, nothing happens. So they're going to play this game uh, repeatedly, uh, but the twist is going to be that uh, they're going to play three end rounds. Uh, Norman is going to be allowed to play normally, but Ray is going to be restricted in that during those three end rounds, she has to use each uh, option exactly n times. Okay, and again, just to connect it back to the card guessing uh, thing, we can imagine giving Ray at the beginning of the game this like deck of cards labeled rock, paper, and scissors. Um, and each time she makes a move, she just discards one of these cards. And again, uh, Norman can play just, just arbitrarily. And uh, part of the reason and part of the like, motivation for this work uh, and looking at rock, paper, scissors like, as a, a motivating example, in addition to being like, a, a well-known game, um, it was also studied, uh, a version of this was studied by uh, Fukumoto called Restricted Rock, Paper, Scissors. So this is the, the symmetric version of this game where both players, so they're going to play three end rounds, and both players have to use each of rock, paper, scissors exactly n times. So the semi-restricted version was just like, you know, kind of a natural, like, asymmetric version of this thing so here. And I'm guessing most of you have not heard of this uh, math journal, partially because it's written entirely in Japanese, and partially because it's not a math journal. Um, it's a, a manga magazine. Um, so this is not actually any math thing. It's just like a, a comic book about this guy who like plays games against like Don bosses and like it's basically Squid Games 30 years before Squid Games happened. And one of the games they played was this rock paper scissors thing. Uh, here's a, a picture of them, uh, the anime 
playing this uh, restricted rock, paper, scissors thing. Um, it's also why I have such a high res, ha, uh, such a perfect picture of uh, this deck of cards with uh, <laughs> rock, paper, scissors. Um, so yeah, it's kind of funny. This um, the adversarial card guessing thing was one of my, was one of three papers I've written now based off of a joke, um, <laughs> and this is the first paper I've written based off an anime. So yeah, I'm hoping in the future to have much more uh, work in, in these uh, directions. Uh, but anyway, back to the math. Uh, kind of the two natural things to ask once I give you a game are, you know, what are the optimal strategies for either player? We'll focus mostly on Ray. And like, what are the, what's like the optimal score here in particular? Uh, how much of an advantage does Norman have in the game? It's clear he has some amount of advantage. He can win in particular in the last round, as Emily pointed out, as long as he has a good memory of what's happened up to this point. Um, but it's not immediately clear, like, what's, what's good. So, you know, for concreteness, let's look at the case n equals 1. I'm going to play, you know, each of rock, paper, and scissors exactly one time. Um, does anyone have a suggestion for what I should do in the, the first round of the game? Well, I mean, well, I mean, do you, you want me to play rock? Do you want to just play rock with 100% probability, or? Yeah, so yeah, so the awful thing to do is uh, to do, uh, at the start of the game, to do, do it uniformly at random. Right, that's the, the, the opposite thing to do. But now maybe I have rock and paper, and it's a bit less clear of how I should you know, distribute my uh, probability weights. Um, so it, what I'm going to claim to you is that if I have rock and paper left, I should play paper with probably two-thirds and rock with probably a third. Um, it's not going to go through like, the whole justification for why that's true, but the intuition is that, uh, say, I'm going to tell Norman that this is my strategy, and now he's going to consider like, what he should play in response to this. So he's definitely not going to play uh, uh, it rock because he can only uh, lose if he, uh, against rock and paper. Uh, if he plays paper himself, he'll win with probably a third because that's how often I'm playing rock and like tie otherwise. So he'll have a one third uh, expected gain. Um, if he plays uh, scissors, he'll win with probably two thirds, uh, but lose with probably one third. So in expectation, his like total change in score is going to be one third. Um, and I'm assuming uh, each round you, you gain a point or lose a point as a zero-sum game. Uh, so at least under this distribution, um, no matter what reasonable option Norman plays, he'll gain uh, one-third points uh, in expectation. So this is kind of like spreading out uh, like the advantage he has. And this you can prove without too much difficulty is, is the optimal strategy. And I'll leave as an exercise what to do if you only have rock uh, left as your uh, move. Um, <laughs> So this is like what happens with n equals one, and and so unsurprisingly, this is a, again basically tells the whole story. Um, it turns out the optimal strategy for Ray is if she has all three uh, options available to her, she'll play each of them uniformly random. Uh, if she only has two options, she'll play the stronger card with um, uh, probably two thirds, and the other one with probably one third. And if she has only one thing, she'll just do that thing. Um, and again, this is all regardless of like how many copies of each thing she has, which is you know kind of surprising. But yes. What does it mean to be a strong card? Yeah, yeah. So it's not. So when I have like rock and paper, paper beats rock. So we're saying like this is the, the stronger of the cards. Uh, yeah, it's not like formal definition, but I, I don't know how else you describe like oh, yeah. the three That's pairs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. Good question. Uh, yeah, and given this result, it's not terribly difficult to, to analyze and prove that uh, Norm's advantage is roughly square root of n. Uh, if uh, if uh, if you start with n copies of each uh, available thing, um, any questions, comments at this point? Cool. So this is all rock paper scissors. But now I want to talk about some more uh, general games you can discuss. And these games are all going to come from diagrams. You can do this for all like a, an arbitrary zero sum game, but for like kind of simplicity, we focus the games that come from diagraphs. And the way this uh, diagraph game works is you, you start with your favorite diagraph, and you have two players. And each round, they'll, they'll simultaneously pick a vertex of your diagraph. And if, the, say, one and two are picked here, uh, because there's a, an arc that points from one to two, the player that picked uh, one will gain a point, and the player that picked two will lose a point. Um, if both players pick something where there's not an arc, say they pick like, the same vertex twice, then nothing happens, it's a draw. Um, so can anyone tell me what the, the D game is in this particular instance? It is rock, paper, scissors, yeah, because, you know, pick one, two, that's, yeah, you can just call this rock, paper, scissors, it's exactly the, the same game. So this is, you know, why we looked at these kind of things, it's kind of a natural uh, generalization of, of rock, paper, scissors. And um, motivated by, again, this semi-restricted stuff, um, we'll, uh, given, like, some parameter vector uh, r, 
uh, will define the semi-restricted D game with this parameter, be the game where we have two players, Ray and Norman, iteratively play this D game, uh, with the restriction that Ray has to play each vertex V exactly RV times. And again, Norman can just play normally. Okay. Uh, so these are the games, and now we want to prove you know, some general results about what goes on here. Um, and the first thing, let's get a band in my clicker. Um, so first of all, again, just to drown ourselves, uh, if we use this digraph D and we take the, the vector that goes N, 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 this is exactly the semi-restricted rock, paper, scissors game I described before. Okay. And again, we're going to look at you know, optimal strategies, optimal scores. We'll start with uh, optimal scores. And for that, we'll define SDR to be the expected score that Norman has in this game uh, if they, both players play optimal. So uh, I first claim there's a relatively easy lower bound here. So for any vertex V, I claim that this quantity here is a lower bound. And why is that? You can consider the strategy where uh, Norman just plays the vertex V every single round, no matter what uh, Ray does. Um, my friend actually does this when he plays rock, paper, scissors. He only plays paper. Um, it's called like the, re that he calls this the ream strategy. Um, so you can view uh, these things as like generalized reams, uh, ream strategies. Anyway, um, if he does this like ream strategy of just picking V every single round, he'll win every time uh, Ray picks a vertex which is pointed to by V. And he'll, he'll lose every time that Ray picks a vertex that points to uh, him. So deterministically, this will be his score if he plays V every time. So he can just you know pick the best vertex that does this, and 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 uh, so surprisingly, well, very anticipation. Uh, these it turns out that these generalized Ream strategies are like basically best possible in general. Um, so it's exactly the same thing as before, plus roughly the the number of rounds you play uh, to the two third power. So up to some error term, more or less the best thing that Norman can do is just pick his favorite vertex and just play it every single round. Um, and this works for, for general restriction vectors, but you might say, like, well, the most natural case is, you know, when there's weight n on, on each of them to start. And here, um, the bounds become simpler and also a bit stronger. So the two-thirds becomes a one-half here. Um, and you can write the, the linear term now in, like, nicer digraph language. And moreover, these bounds are actually best possible. Uh, the two-thirds here, we don't think is, like, really the correct thing. That's the best we can prove. But if you tell me ahead of time each vertex gets weight n, we can prove this n to that one half, and that is optimal because of rock, paper, scissors, for example. Okay. Um, and I'll note that this becomes particularly nice if you look at Eulerian diagraphs. The Eulerian diagraphs are just those that have the same in degree as the out degree. And in this situation here, this main term just reduces to zero, so these bounds are just between zero and n to the one half. And we suspect that this n to the one half is basically tight all the time. Uh, so we say, think if we have an Eulerian diagraph which has at least one arc, uh, it should have Norman should have advantage at least roughly square root of n. Uh, that's what we suspect, um, and we can prove this in some cases when certain spectral conditions are uh, satisfied. Um, so in particular, we'll define the the skew adjacency matrix of a digraph to be basically this thing here. If you have a, an arc from one to two, we'll put in the one two entry of one. If you have an arc from 2 to 1, we'll put a, a negative 1 in the 2, 1 entry. So this is a, a skew symmetric matrix that's you know, kind of natural to associate to the digraph. And it turns out that um, if you have a digraph such that the only null vectors it has are multiples of the all ones vector, uh, then this score is going to be uh, of order square root of n here. Um, and uh, in particular, we can prove that this condition is satisfied whenever d is an Eulerian term. Um, we have particular interest in Eulerian tournaments because um, uh, these like are related to rock paper scissors, in the sense that there are various ways you can define generalize rock paper scissors. There's things like uh, rock paper scissors blizzard Spock, which has like the three things, but also now two additional things that are related in some way. There are like things like RPS 41, which have 41 different things you can pick, um, and like each of them beat half the things and each of them lose to half the things, and basically. There's a million ways you could try to generalize rock, paper, scissors, but they all have the property that you know you pick some object and each object beats half the other objects and loses to half the other objects, and every two objects are comparable. Like that's you know perhaps like the most natural way you would define rock, paper, scissors in general, and like that's exactly saying this is a D game where D is an Eulerian term. So this is saying that for you know every possible generalization of rock, paper, scissors you can come up with, the the semi-restricted advantage here is roughly squared. Um, and for those that like spectral graph theory in the audience, um, we have no idea like what digraphs have this property here. Um, 
other than you know like Larian terms and a couple other examples. And it seems like independent like this has no game theory at this point. It's just like a pure spectral question. Like what diagrams have this property? We have no idea. Um, and it'd be interesting just to you know figure out what that is. Uh, let's see what else. Ah yes. Now we're going to go to uh, optimal strategies. Um, so I guess let me not put those words on the screen yet. Um, so uh, we've seen for this like matching to penny, that to matching penny game, there's a unique optimal strategy that was greedy. Same for um, semi-restricted rock, paper, scissors. So you might say like, oh, do all these semi-restricted games have like this nice, unique, greedy strategy or whatever? And the answer is not quite. Um, so the directed path on three vertices have more complicated optimal strategies. Um, so a strategy is optimal if and only if, whenever you can, uh, Ray draws uh, the third vertex with probability half, and she doesn't care what you do with like the other thing. But any probability is p, p here, um, as long as you draw that third vertex uh, with probability half. And she does not have to keep this p consistent. She can say like oh, every even round I'll take p to be a half, every odd round I'll take it to be zero or whatever. So she can do whatever you want as long as you just keep drawing each th the third vertex with probability half whenever she can. Um, so this is less nice than you know, perhaps the other two, which had you. Know, one unique thing, but still, it's relatively nice here because, again, I don't need to tell you anything about how many times remaining she can play each option, only what options she has available. And that was the same thing as what happened with you know the matching pennies and the rock, paper, scissors. So all that mattered was what was available, not you know how much of each thing. So um, you can ask, um, you know, does, yes, Bernard? Do you have some easy intuition why the one half or the yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's it's very similar to the same intuition for the rock paper scissors. So, say I'm doing say I'm doing this thing with your favorite value p, and now Norman is considering what he should play. So he should either play one or two. Clearly, um, so if he plays one, he'll win with probably a half minus p. If he plays two, he'll win with probably a half, but lose with probability p. So by doing um, this, each of those two things are just I, as good. I forgot. I somehow saw that there is the transitive edge from one to three. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you. yeah, no, this is good to, to, to spell, I guess. So, like, it looks mysterious here, but it's exactly just, like, what strategies, like, distribute again, like, how, uh, make, make Norman's options just as good off as each other. Um, yeah, so, um, anyway, motivated by, by this, all these results, we asked, um, uh, is it true that every uh, semi-restricted game has an oblivious optimal strategy for Ray? In other words, one where she doesn't have to actually look at you know how many times she can play each thing. Uh, she only has to care about like what uh, she has available. And you know if this were true, you could have like you can get many strong results. In particular, that square root of n conjecture turns out to be true. Uh, sadly, you get too many strong results, um, and it's false. Uh, so in particular, uh, we can prove that this weird-looking diagraph here does not have an oblivious optimal strategy in this semi-restricted game. And what this diagraph is is it's it's basically a complete uh, bipartite graph where you orient most of the edges going upwards, except for this uh, perfect matching which you have going downward. So it turns out that um, this thing does not have an ability to optimal strategy, and it gets um, worse. Um, we can construct uh, an infinite family of Eulerian tournaments, uh, none of which have oblivious optimal strategies for Ray. Um, so again, tying this back to like rock, paper, scissors, or whatever, this proves that there exist generalizations of rock, paper, scissors, which do not have nice strategies for Ray. We don't. I have, I have no idea like what the strategy is for this or for any of these things that we construct here. But we can prove they're hard or complicated in some sense. So there exists some variants of rock paper scissors which are complicated in terms of their optimal strategy. But nevertheless, our, our spectral result says that their score is going to be roughly squared of n. So despite the fact that we have no idea what these strategies are and we can prove that they're difficult, they're complicated, we know roughly what their their expected. Cool. So that's the summary of all our, our main results. Uh, for the rest of the time, I'm going to talk about as many of these proofs as I can. Uh, does anyone have any preference for what I talk about, or questions or comments about any of these results or questions? Think about? Okay, cool. So I figured I'd start with the, the spectral stuff, since I know people like that here. Um, so uh, the rough idea of this proof is, say Ray is for some given in the sense that she'll pick vertex u with probability p u. Um, then uh, Norman's expected payoff will be, again, be he's just going to pick the vertex which maximizes his expected gain for that round. There's not, no reason he should do anything else. And the, the crucial observation is that this is, roughly speaking, the, the infinity norm of AP, um, when, where again A is the skew symmetric matrix and P is this uh, probability vector. This would literally be, ignoring this thing, this would literally be equal to this thing here if there were absolute value signs uh, here. This is just the definition of the infinity norm. Uh, when you take this matrix here. 
Um, the only annoyance is that now you don't have that, but because uh, this summon, these terms here all add up to zero, um, if like the negative, if some negative term is uh, making this, achieving the L infinity, uh, then there must be some relatively large positive thing as well. So in any case, this, 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 the expected payoff is roughly the infinity norm of this thing here, is the main takeaway. And now one of two things can happen during the game. Um, either Ray uses a lot of uh, probability vectors, which are far from multiples of the all ones vector, um, in which case each of these rounds uh, Ray, Norman has like a relatively high payoff, expected payoff. So if you, she just does this enough times, Norman's just going to get a large payoff and he's, he's happy. Um, the other scenario is she plays uh, many vectors P which are close to multiples of the all ones vector, which is what's basically saying she's playing close to a uniform distribution for that round. And if she literally played uniformly for every round until something ran out, it's not too difficult to prove that you're going to get a, a square root of n uh, lower round here. And with some work, you can prove if, for, if you're doing something close to uniform, you can also achieve uh, a square root of n lower round. Any questions, comments about this proof? Cool. Uh, so next I want to talk about uh, some of the other bounds. Um, so first, this uh, like general upper bound showing like these ream strategies or whatever are good uh, when you have weight n everywhere. So the way we'll prove this is we'll consider uh, the following strategy for Ray. She'll uh, uniformly random just pick vertices of the digraph until something runs out. Then she'll just give up and, and play arbitrarily. Um, and the, the key observation is that until something runs out, Norman's expected gain each round is going to be this quantity here. Because again, it's just he picks a vertex, it's going to win with this probability here and lose with this probability here because Ray's playing uniformly amongst the vertices. Um, so uh, the expected number of points that Norman gets until something runs out is just you know, the maximum score he can get during that round times the number of rounds where this happens, which is at most just the total number of rounds in the whole game. So this quantity here is just exactly this main term uh, here. So that's, that part's easy. And then uh, we're going to show that in expectation, there's only going to be about square root of n uh, rounds left in the end of the game after, if, if Ray plays according to the strategy. Um, and like the rough intuition here is that if you look at any like pile of vertices and ask like how many things are left at you know time t or whatever, this is going to basically be a binomial distribution um, because you know she's just playing uniformly and like each round like that thing independently gets picked or not picked with probability one over v d. Um, this is slightly lying and like you should more precisely be modeling it by like a negative binomial distribution. But in any case, let's just pretend it was a binomial distribution. Well, it's well known that these are um, very concentrated around their expectation, plus or minus roughly square root of n, square root of, of their expectation. And that's like heuristically where this uh, where square root of n is, is coming from. With this. So this is how you do the argument if you have uh, weight n on each vertex. Things become a little more complicated if you try to do um, this more general version. Uh, and the way we'll do this is first as like a technicality, uh, Ray will just like get rid of all the vertices which have very low weight. So if some vertex only ha she can only play it like m to, m to the two thirds time. So just play all those um, and give up at most roughly m to the two thirds points, which we can absorb in, in our error term. So we can assume at this point that we were just given some vector which did not have this anyway. Uh, and now what Ray will do is she'll play each vertex with probability proportional to how much it had uh, at the beginning of the game. Um, and then again, once something runs out, she'll just play arbitrarily. And again, the analysis is, is very similar to four. Um, during this first phase, until something runs out, the expected gain for Norman uh, is going to be at most this thing for any given round, and there's at most this many total rounds. And basically the way I've, I've cooked up these probabilities is such that this quantity is again exactly the main term here. So we're good there, and now it's just a remainder of uh, this uh, error term. And basically, again, using some concentration results for negative binomial random variables, you can prove that um, the number of actions uh, for any given vertex v at the end of this phase is going to be at most this quantity here. And uh, this is just m by definition. And by this like technicality assumption, this is at most m to the 2 thirds. So in total, we get that this is at most this, which is m to the 2 thirds. Uh, so that proves um, this upper bound. Further questions, comments about any of this up to this point? Cool. Now I want to talk about optimal strategies. Yes, optimal strategies. 
Uh, so I'm going to say a few words about rock, paper, scissors, but not go into too much because it's a little technical. Uh, kind of the main thing to, to prove here, uh, so again, the, the optimal strategy is this like, greedy thing where you just do the optimal thing that's best for a given round and don't care about what happens in, in later rounds. And kind of the only way that could possibly be an optimal strategy is if uh, Ray's score won't change that much in expectation, regardless of whether she picks like paper or scissors in any you know, given round. And this is basically saying this uh, more formally. Uh, the score uh, of Norman, if we're at some point and uh, Ray draws a scissors, which is basically what this is saying, is at most what happens when Ray draws a paper plus one. So basically, if yeah, Ray's in this sum game and she's like deciding between scissors and papers, um, she can't be off by worse than one in expectation if she decides to draw scissors as opposed to, to paper. Um, and this you can just prove by some kind of annoying uh, inductive like stra uh, a strategy stealing uh, argument. And once you have this result, it's not too hard to prove that you know if you give me any proposed optimal strategy, um, if you're not trying to optimize for that given round, uh, then I can tweak the probabilities a bit, and things don't change too much because of this, and you end up winning more or less. Again, I won't go through the details of that, but that's how you prove basically all of the, the optimal strategy stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it seems to me that that's uh, kind of an Azuma kind of argument that, that we typically use, that, that it's a um, um, Markov chain argument, mm -hmm. where, where things only differ by one. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a Lipschitz-type condition, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. So you, you in, I guess, philosophically, it's similar. Yeah, I guess that is a good way to think. Yeah, that, I think yeah, that's a good, that's a very good way to think about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. You use some linear algebra here. So. Yeah, so this is, I think it's like purely just like I wouldn't even call it linear algebra. It's like inequality man manipulation. It's like very. It's a so basically what it is is like how you prove this. You say all right, take a minimal counter example uh, in terms of like how many like cards you have, and you say okay, I'm gonna be raised in this world. What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pretend I'm in this world for the moment, um, and then afterwards play optimally. Um, and the point is, uh, so basically for that, and what's the idea here? The idea is that um, if uh, I can do this, unless uh, here, you know, maybe I have no scissors, and here uh, in this world I, I, I should have drawn a scissor, in which case, okay, I'll just say I lost, and you just give me, pay me a, a cost of one or whatever for that. Uh -huh. and, and more or less, this is how you uh, end up proving it. And they just write down, like, inductively, like, you kind of recurse on, like, what your score is, and then things, the numbers end up working. Other questions, comments? Cool. And then I think we have uh, the last uh, proof that I want to talk about, which is why the heck is this? Uh, so I mentioned before, this has no ability to optimal strategy. Why the heck is that? Um, so I won't entirely answer that question, but um, let's assume you know that that Ray did have an oblivious optimal strategy here, and we just fix you know some probability vector, and she'll just keep picking vertices according to that probability vector until something runs out. That's the definition of what it means to have an oblivious optimal strategy. Um, we can show that for this diagraph specifically, uh, if there were some two vertices, W and W prime, where these quantities here were different, and these are just like the expected payoff for Norman if he pays W versus W prime, uh, if there were any two which were different from each other, uh, then there exists some uh, restriction vector where um, the score of the game is going to be much larger than this quantity here. Um, but by our theorem that I mentioned a couple slides ago, uh, the score, optimal score here is always asymptotic to this quantity here. So this will be um, a contradiction. So any oblivious optimal strategy must have all these quantities equal to each other. They must have it that Norman is equally fine playing any vertex here, which is you know kind of what we saw again with like rock paper scissor in this directed path. Um, these all these optimal strategies kind of made it so all the vertices were just as good for, for Norman as they could have. Um, but uh, one can show that uh, no matter what probability vector you pick for this diagraph here, you, you're going to have two things different from each other. You can kind of heuristically see this by saying that like, oh, these bottom vertices are always going to be much better because they beat two things but only lose to one thing while these do the opposite. Um, so that's very hand wavy um, why this is uh, the case. And I'll note that somewhat more generally, you can prove this result or this, this same conclusion holds if you have a diagraph or this first part, I guess, holds. Uh, if you have a digraph where um, the, the out neighborhood is not dominated by, not contained in any other vertex. So that's the T property here. So like, 
like naively, each vertex could be the best thing for a given like restriction vector. So for example, if I give you a restriction vector and like I just put all the weight uh, on this vertex here, then for Norman, the best thing is always going to be to play this vertex here. Um, because nothing else points to, to, to this vertex here. And similarly, if I put all the weight on both of these two vertices, then the best thing that Norman can do is play this vertex here. Because again, no vertex points to both of these vertices. So because if you have any digraph where the out neighborhood is not contained, there's no pair of vertices where one out neighborhood is contained in the other, uh, then this first conclusion here, uh, yeah, then this first conclusion here holds. And then it's just a matter of, is it true that every probability vector will fail to have this property? And that's what happens here, and it happens basically in, in the, the Eulerian tournaments that we construct. Um, any questions about any of this stuff or any other math before I go into some concluding remarks? Yes, sir. Do, do you have a good way of uh, determining which ones succeed and which ones fail? Uh, in what, what do you mean by succeed or fail? The, so the Eulerian tournaments have the strategy. And this one, the oblivious optimal, and this one does not. So, so the tournaments don't in general. Oh, don't so, so rock, paper, scissors do, but we can construct infinite, an infinite family using a similar proof here that um, do not have oblivious optimal strategies. I see. I see. Um, but yeah, we don't have like a, a way to check. So again, there's this like relatively simple like combinatorial property you can check, and then it's, a, it's again a linear algebra question yeah, of like, oh, The nesting just, thing I would expect not to happen most of the time. Right, so, right, 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 right. Um, yeah, so like you can say, for example, if you take like a random tournament, for example, it's like very unlikely that any pair of vertices have like some nested, so like this condition will hold in like a random digraph or whatever, like almost surely. But it's the the matter of like does there exist a null vector for those become a bit more complicated. Um, so I guess like that is the the real uh, uh, yeah the bottleneck. There's the word. Um, but yeah, good good question. Any other questions, comments about math? Specifically this math, ideally. So, I might have missed it, but so mm -hmm. what do the other examples look like? Of so, it looks like uh, this thing here, mm -hmm. uh, add a directed triangle like this, add a directed triangle like this, um, and that's like an example. And then we have a bunch of other ones which are basically add that same thing and then like have half of them point to here and half of them point away from, from there. Okay. Um, you could definitely come up with like more complicated examples of like an infinite family, but we just Basically, we can prove something stronger. Like, if you have like a, a subgraph, I'm gonna lie. So, if you have a subgraph which like fails to have an oblivious optimal strategy, then like you can sometimes lift that and say that like in fact, if the support was like just all on that subgraph, then like also you're gonna fail to have an oblivious optimal strategy more or less, if the, as long as the other vertices don't like interfere too much um, outside it. Um, but um, yes, I think that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Other questions, comments. Cool, so I'll end with a few questions. Uh, one of them is like, okay, I proved to you that there don't exist oblivious optimal strategies here. Um, how bad can uh, the optimal strategies be here? So we know like the, the simplest hope of like, uh, every game has an oblivious optimal strategy, can't hold, but you know, maybe they're not much more complicated than that. Um, and you know, and this thing here is like the smallest example we know of that definitely doesn't have an oblivious optimal strategy. So you could, you know, code up on the computer like for small like, a uh, number of moves, you know, how, what, what do these optimal strategies look like, and maybe try and get a guess for, for what's going on here. Um, another thing is that we don't know the optimal strategies for, like, basically any, basically, the examples I showed you are basically all we know, more or less. So it would be nice to have, you know, a, a larger family of games that we know, and, like, perhaps one tractable problem is to look at uh, off the directed paths. Um, so I believe that my conjecture, more or less, is that for a directed path, you can basically pick any probability you want for the first vertex, and that this should determine uniquely what your probability should be for, for the latter vertices. Um, this is like, morally speaking, what it looks like if you want to again distribute, like, if you want all of Norman's like reasonable options to be just as good as each other, this is, this is what ends up happening. Um, and like, it's very complicated to write down what exactly these probabilities should be, so this may not be pleasant to work out, but I think it's in theory a, a solvable uh, class of things. Uh, another one, as I mentioned before, is um, again just the purely spectral question: which digraphs have this uh, Noli property, which is again partially motivated by this conjecture of um, if you have a Noli layer in digraph, that the score should be roughly square root of n. We again know that, that we have this upper bound of square root of n, and the question is: is it possible to get like significantly smaller uh, than that? And yeah, I think this is where I'm going to end. Awesome. Any other questions?
questions for Sam? Okay, awesome. Well, thank you again for coming.